Will Dean Barber Reimer please conduct forward Michael R. Bloomberg. Mr. Chancellor, I have the honor to present Michael R. Bloomberg, who has re been recommended by the faculty and approved by the Board of Des Trustees for the degree of Doctor of Laws. Michael Bloomberg is the 108th mayor of the city of New York. He was, he was first elected mayor in 2001, just two months after the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. At the time, many feared that that crime would overtake New York, business would flee, the city would never recover. Instead, through hundreds of innovative new policies and initiatives, Bloomberg is credited with making New York City safer, stronger, and greener than ever. He attended Johns Hopkins University, where he paid his stu tuition with student loans and income from working as a parking lot attendant. Does that sound familiar? After college, he earned an MBA from Harvard Business School. Bloomberg began his career at Salomon Brothers, a prominent Wall Street investment bank. He used his experience there to envision an information company that would use emerging technology to bring transparency and efficiency to buyers and sellers of financial securities. The result is Bloomberg LP, a company that has about 15,000 employees worldwide and more than 300,000 subscribers to its global financial news and information services. As his company grew, Bloomberg began to direct more of his attention to philanthropy, to donating time and resources to many worthy causes, especially Johns Hopkins, where he helped to build the Bloomberg School of Public Health into a leading institution of public health research and training. Bloomberg's extraordinary career in business, philanthropy, and public service has few parallels in the opening decades of the 21st century. For outstanding accomplishment in business, public service, and philanthropy, the University of North Carolina is pleased to confer on Michael Rubens Bloomberg the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa and invites him to deliver the 2012 commencement address. vested in the University of North Carolina by the State of North Carolina and by the University entrusted to me, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Tar! 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 Forgive me, but I just wanted to start this morning by shouting something. But I knew what would happen if I said, Ra Ra Carolina Lina, Ra Ra Carolina Lina, Ra Ra Carolina Lina. Positive note, good morning, faculty, family, friends of the great class of 2012. And I particularly wanted to thank Chancellor Thorpe and the UNC Board of Trustees, including my friend and your fellow alum, Peter Grauer, for inviting me here. I also want to thank the president of the UNC system, Thomas Ross, and a former UNC system president, my old friend Dick Spangler. You should know that Dick and I went to the Harvard Business School just because neither of us could get into UNC. <laughs> I am thrilled to be standing here today, not only because UNC is one of our country's oldest and greatest institutions, I'm actually thrilled to be standing here because it means I did not trip on the bricks walking over here. 
it's really treacherous out there. But I know this is only one of the many challenges you have overcome on the way to your diplomas today. You have battled your way through trying to find a parking place on campus. You've battled your way through trying to register for classes on Connect Carolina. You have battled through living in Hilton James and having to walk in the rain to an AM class at Graham Memorial. And you've battled your way through many games of zombies and humans. Now, I have to admit, I'd never heard of that game, but it does sound like good preparation for anyone who'll be moving to Washington, D.C. <laughs> You've survived it all, and here you are. However, while this is a very special day for you graduates, before, before imparting some of my invaluable, indispensable words of wisdom, I would like to say something about another important group here today. They are sitting on the sides here, beaming proudly, and not even thinking about what it costs to get to this day. <laughs> or what happens if you can't get a job and have to move back home. I am talking about your parents and relatives, so why not you give them a big hand? since today is not only a very special day here, but a very special day across our country, let me wish all the mothers here Happy Mother's Day. Being asked to speak at UNC is really a dream come true for me, and I want this commencement speech to be different from any speech that has ever been given. And in light of recent events here at Chapel Hill, there was only one way to do that. So I plan to slow jam the commencement address. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't convince Branford Marcellus to join me. <laughs> but I'm still determined to make this memorable. So I did do a lot of research to put me fully in the UNC groove. Since I arrived this morning, I've already climbed the bell tower and signed my name. I sat on the Davy Poplar bench. I challenged Chancellor Thorpe to a Rubik's Kill contest and got my butt whipped. I drank out of the old well for good luck. Someone told me to be careful since some fraternity guys had just been there, but I went ahead anyways. And finally, I joined a flash grave at the library. But I watched, and for the record, did not join, a group of speakers run across the pit into the UL and then sing the alma mater. It has been a great morning, and I haven't even played a few, few rounds of senior bar golf yet. So in any case, I'm feeling almost prepared for today as you graduates are. You've made it, you've done it, you've earned it. And I'm sure this week has been spent reliving memories and retelling stories. And I know there'll be more of that tonight. But right now, I want you to take a look around you and think not about where everyone has been, but where they are going. The guy in front of you could win an Academy Award someday. The girl behind you could be a future president of the United States or even, better than that, the mayor of New York City. <laughs> the guy sitting to your right could be a future Nobel laureate. Okay, maybe not the guy to your right, but certainly the one to your left. There is no telling what the future holds, for you or for anyone else. This is an exciting time in your life, and it's also an exciting time in history. More than any other generation that has walked the earth, you are free to pursue your dreams, unbounded by limits placed on your race, gender, ethnicity, orientation, or lineage. Only a lack of education can hold you back in America, and today you've cleared that bar, and you've done it at one of the finest institutions in the country. Your freedom, coupled with the diploma you will receive today, is something that people around the world would risk life and limb for. 
don't ever take it for granted. It has been won through suffering and sacrifice, by freedom fighters and freedom riders, by abolitionists and suffragettes. It has been won at the ballot box and on the battlefield, in state houses and courthouses. The path of victory has not always been straight or swift, but it has been sure and steady. And that's been the story of America stretching back to our earliest days. At our nation's founding, African Americans were held in bondage. Those without property could not vote. Catholics could not hold office. Women could not vote or hold office and homosexuality was, in some places, a crime punishable by death. But over time, we understood that freedoms are not fully shared, if not fully safe. If government can deny freedom to one, it can deny freedom to all. Exclusion, exclusion and equality are mortal enemies, and in America, Every time they have met in battle, equality has ultimately <coughs> triumphed. Throughout our history, each and every generation has expanded upon the freedoms won by their parents and grandparents. Each and every generation has removed some barrier to full participation in the American dream. The work is not over. Far from it. And I would argue last week's referendum banning same-sex marriage shows just how much more work needs to be done to ensure freedom and equality for all people. When the torch passes from one generation to the next, the light of liberty always shines more brightly. And I have no doubt that in your lifetime, liberty's life will allow us to see more clearly the truth of our nation's founding principles and allow us to see all people and all couples as full and equal members of the American family. that Freedom's journey is making is only half of what makes this moment in history so exciting. The other half is symbolized by something that you're probably holding in your hand or your pocket right now, your phone. The smartphone is arguably the greatest invention the world has ever seen, and the reason is simple. It democratizes technology. Whether you're building an app or writing a review on Yelp or checking in on Foursquare, you are making the computer and everyone who uses it smarter. Since the dawn of time, we have been sharing knowledge with each other, but today, knowledge is being shared globally and as quickly as it is being discovered individually. That revolution in computer-based communications, which started in government laboratories and in Steve Jobs' garage and in the little office that I rented 30 years ago, is now being led by the masses. Whether you like it or not, the computer nerds have won. We're all computer nerds now. The creation of the smartphone is the most visible symbol of the technological revolution we're experiencing. But it's happening all around us. In every industry, the speed of innovation is moving at breathtaking pace. You can see it just down the road at Research Triangle Park. You can see it in Silicon Valley, in Boston, Mass, and in Austin, Texas. All of those places are home to great universities where pioneering work is being done and good jobs are being created. In New York City, we've joined forces with Cornell University, NYU and Carnegie Mellon, as well as the Technion Institute of Technology in Israel and universities in Canada, the UK and India to develop new world-class applied science and engineering campuses. We know the future of the global economy is tied to the discoveries that are made by university-educated researchers and innovators. And if those discoveries happen in New York City, we know the company's spin-off from, spin from them will start in New York City. Now, I have no doubt that many of you here today will be a part of these discoveries. Your work will reshape our understanding of the world, everything from the origins, origins of the universe to a cure for cancer. For the non-scientists here, 
you too will have an important job to play. You business and finance majors, you may be providing the capital for the discoveries to be brought to market. Education and journalism majors, you may be writing or teaching about those discoveries. Nursing and pre-med students, you may be talking to patients about them. And you future lawyers, yes, lawyers always have to be involved in everything we do. You will be needed to protect patents and, of course, fight off other lawyers. The technology revolution that is reshaping our understanding of the world and the freedom that you join to pursue your dreams are complementary, which is why I've mentioned both of them. They reinforce each other. The more we learn, the freer we will be. And the freer we are, the more we will learn. Lux Libertas, light and liberty. That is the motto of your university. And that, I believe, will be the defining spirit of the 21st century. The more light we shed on the nature of the world, the more we advance knowledge in science and technology, the more liberty we will spread. In fact, I would argue that the technological revolution that is now underway will not only be our most powerful weapon in the fight against poverty and disease, it will be our most powerful weapon in the fight against repression and intolerance. Because where there is light, liberty grows, and where there is liberty, light flows. It's up to all of you, in your own way, to take what you've learned here and spread light and liberty wherever you go. That may sound like a daunting task, and I understand if you're thinking, sure, I'll be happy to do that once I find a job. But whether you have a job lined up or are still figuring out your next step, don't think that you've got your career all figured out. No plan for the rest of your life ever works out the way you thought it would. For example, I was an engineering major who then went to business school in hopes of someday running a factory which I knew nothing about. I got the MBA and then I took an entry-level job in the financial services industry, which I knew nothing about. Fifteen years later, I got fired and I started a company in another industry I knew nothing about, information technology. Twenty years after that, I ran for May even though I knew nothing about politics. Some people say I still don't. You don't need a grand plan. Whatever plan you do have is probably going to change a hundred times before you're 30 years old. And you don't need to be an expert in something to try it. So what then do you need to do? Okay, I'm going to tell you. But really, all I'm going to do is remind you of the few things you've already learned here just by watching Carolina basketball. First, make career decisions the same way you fill out your tournament brackets. Follow your heart and go with your gut. Do what you love, find a ways to get paid for it, and if you ever have the luxury of multiple job offers, don't make the decision based on salary alone. I know when I was starting out, I turned a down a job with a higher salary because I had a good feeling about the people at another firm, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Your gut won't always be right. For example, who knew NC State would make the Sweet 16? <laughs> But you'll sleep better at night if you go with your gut. <laughs> Second, out-hustle the competition. When I started my first job out of college, I made sure I was the first one in the office every morning and the last one to leave. Not only did it save me the price of the Wall Street Journal, because I just grabbed the office copy, it allowed me to get to know the firm's partners. Woody Allen once said that 80% of success is showing up. I actually think he got it half right. 80% of success is showing up early and staying late. Third, you occasionally have to throw some elbows. It's true, it's rough out there, no matter what profession you're in. Of course, in most professions, you don't break your wrist driving to the basket, thankfully. But the world is competitive. I've been in the business world, and I've been in government. And people ask me all the time, what's the difference? And I always tell them, the business world is dog eat dog. And government, it's exactly the reverse. <laughs> Don't be afraid to assert, assert yourself. Have confidence in your abilities. And don't let the bastards get you down. Fourth. Fourth, teamwork is everything. 
I could never have built my company without the three brilliant guys I started it with. And whatever success I've achieved as mayor results from surrounding myself with the most talented people that I could find. The innovations that are coming out of the Research Triangle Park in Silicon Valley in New York City are all built on teamwork. The person who works the hardest and works with others the best, who says we and us and doesn't use the words I and me, is the person who will win. Fifth, don't be afraid to shoot the long ball. Take the risk. Life is too short to spend your ta time avoiding failure. If I had worried about failure or listened to those who do, I would never have started my company and never run for mayor. And I can't imagine my life if I hadn't taken those risks. And not every risk, risk will work out, but that's okay. Failure is the world's best teacher. Sixth, never stop studying what the competition is doing and never stop learning. Education is a lifetime journey. When you leave these walls, keep asking questions, <coughs> keep acquiring knowledge, keep seeking truth. Don't let party labels blind you. No party in government has a monopoly on truth or God on its side. And I should know, I was a Democrat before I was a Republican, before I became an independent. And I never changed my principles. And I have enormous respect for your former president and my friend Erskine Bowles, because he has always put pragmatism ahead of partisanship. And I hope all of you will do exactly that. I think he does deserve a round of applause. Think for yourself, decide for yourself, even if it's not popular or if it runs counter to the party line. If everyone in Washington did that, our country would be a whole lot better off. And now, seventh and the final piece of advice I have is, in the game of life, when the final buzzer sounds, the only stat you carry with you is the number of assists you made. So help other people put some points on the board. Or, as Dickie V might say, don't be slow to dish the rock. There's nothing more rewarding than making a difference in the lives of others. I've learned that firsthand, both through philanthropy and public service. Give what you can, your time, your talents, your money, and I promise you will never forget it. Now, I know you've remembered every single word of that, but just in case, I thought I would provide a summary of the seven in no particular order. Teamwork is everything. Assist others. Risks are necessary. Hmm. The first three letters of those words are T-A-R. I wonder where this is going. <laughs> Hustle always. Elbows occasionally have to be used. Education is a lifelong journey. Love what you do. And if you put that list together, it of course spells tar. Yeah. All right. Before you receive your diploma and leave, I have just one more piece of wisdom to share. When the hard times come in your life, and they will, when the doubts creep in about whether God is looking out for you, just remember that not only did you see an NCAA basketball championship during your time here, but in your senior year, Duke lost in the first round to a 15 seed. So you know there's a God up there in that Carolina blue sky. Congratulations and good luck.